You are about to enter the world of urban legends, where fact is often stranger than fiction. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between truth and urban legend. On Urban Legends, we bring you three remarkable tales. Two are just urban myths, but one story actually happened. Can you guess which one is true? First, a desperate soldier's suicide attempt accidentally deals a crushing blow to his bullying sergeant. Then, a construction worker is flattened by a four-ton steamroller and lives. And there's a story of a man buried alive under heavy snow who uses his own urine to escape. Three stories, only one is true. Can you guess? Watch closely and we'll let you know at the end of the show. Stuttgart, Germany, 1997. U.S. Army Base Theodore Roosevelt. Private Jonathan Overton of the 317th Supply Battalion was a new recruit. At the age of 18, little Johnny joined the military, hoping tough army discipline would give him the spine he seemed to lack. But military training was a lot tougher than he thought. So tough, it drove Johnny to try to take his own life. In the army, those not meeting the top physical and mental standards are dealt with harshly, with the aim of building muscle and character. That job is up to tough disciplinarians who make it their mission to turn even the weakest of boys into combat-ready soldiers. You know, everybody gets a lot of guff when you're at the bottom of the ladder. Everybody expects that, but uh, he, he just had it in for me from day one, to be honest. You in Johnny's battalion, the toughest taskmaster was the notorious Sergeant Glenn Harris. You're the worst soldier in this army. We could never go to war with somebody like you. You couldn't defend an anthill. You know, I didn't enjoy being picked on, so, you know, I was doing my damnedest to, you know, avoid, you know, you know, setting them off. Not so fast, Overton. Overton, give me that mop. I've got something better for you. Get in there. From the beginning, Sergeant Harris made life tough for Johnny thinking nothing of making him clean the filthy latrines with a toothbrush. Having humiliated the recruit, Sergeant Harris next aimed to break Johnny's body and his spirit. Meet Big Bertha, a hundred pound floor polisher that was Sergeant Harris's special surprise for the wimps. It took all of Johnny's strength just to hang on to it. It was whoom, 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 you know arms feel like you're gonna rip out of their sockets. After buffing the same section of hallway for over six hours, Private Overton was more exhausted than he'd ever been in his life. He could scarcely hear at all because of Big Bertha's relentless roar. Johnny was at the breaking point and Sergeant Harris was about to push him one step further. Overton? I think you missed a bit. He just dumped dirty water over the whole thing, just told me to clean it all up again, you know, and I just, that was it. Something snapped inside me, I guess, I don't know. I just, the only way out I thought was to kill myself. I was up on the fifth floor of that building, and I thought what I'd do is I'd take that floor polisher, which is the last thing I've been working with, you know, and I'd, I'd chuck it out of the window with the cord tied around my neck. I hoped it would either choke me or rip my head off or something. Making Private Overton's life miserable was all in a day's work for Sergeant Harris. As he prepared to leave for the day, he was unaware of Johnny's fragile mental state. I just sort of heaved it up on the windowsill there, and I pushed it out the window. The 100-pound polisher dropped like a boulder from the fifth floor window, the cord quickly unwinding behind it. As the buffer fell, it gained speed, enough to instantly snap a human neck once the cord went tight. If the cord went tight. Private Overton 
was still alive. The sergeant's truck was underneath that same window, thereby shortening the distance the polisher had to fall by five feet. It was just enough to spare Johnny's life. Not only did he survive, but Johnny accidentally got some revenge at the same time. Sergeant Harris, now crippled for life. After a court-martial, Overton was sentenced to three months for assault on a superior officer and reckless personal endangerment. True story or false? We'll let you know at the end of the show. First, it's time for a mini-myth. Watch closely and decide if it's fact or fiction. Mini-myth number 777, the car crash Heimlich. Three-year-old Jennifer Simpson from Leeds, England was choking to death on a coin. Her desperate parents were rushing her to the hospital to save her life. As poor Jennifer gasped for air, her father, in a panic, crashed the car. Luckily for everyone, the force of the crash sent the lodged coin flying out of Jennifer's mouth, saving her life. Is that true? Actually, it did happen. Jennifer's now 11 and would like to work in a bank when she grows up. On Urban Legends, we have three incredible stories for you. So far, you've seen the distraught soldier who botched his suicide, crippling his tormenting commanding officer. Could that be true? Or is it our next tale? It's a story of an Englishman who was run over by a steamroller and lived to tell the tale. Remember, we'll let you know at the end of the show which of our three stories is fact and which are fiction. Every day, thousands of construction workers injure themselves in this, one of the most dangerous of professions. Just a minor slip on a job site and a worker could find himself in deep trouble. Of course, some machines are more dangerous than others. Meet the Ingersoll Rand, a four-ton steamroller that has only one job, to squash things flat. This is the story of how, against all odds, a mere man was able to take on the full force of the steamroller and survive. Meet Andrew Jepson from Wolverhampton, England, a construction worker who builds parking lots. I used to set out um, line levels for the car park there that we were building. Heathrow Airport, London, January 20th, 1998. It was a normal workday for Andrew Jepson, except that it was busier than usual, and Andrew found himself distracted by all the commotion. It was a fairly busy site, yeah, when I was there. There was a lot of work going on in different sections, a lot of machinery, quite a noisy site with the constant stream of jumbo jets coming in one afternoon with that. With all the noise around him, Andrew was unaware of a steamroller working behind him. He'd been sick, and this was his first day back at work. And my head was like uh, spinning a bit. Andrew was giving instructions to one of his crew, oblivious to the steamroller that was now heading toward him. Making matters even worse, the driver's jacket was jamming the controls. He was powerless to stop the machine. And he said he got his coat stuck on the lever. Next thing I know, I looked down at my foot and saw that the roller was on my foot. Andrew Jepson was helpless as his entire body was pulled down underneath the four-ton roller. It took less than 15 seconds for the machine to roll the length of Jepson's body, inch by excruciating inch. To give us an idea of the pressure involved, we asked our science expert, Dr. John Kilcoin, to demonstrate using a steamroller on 150 pounds of chicken, exactly Andrew's weight. This is a, a four-ton roller, but it has a device which increases its mass to 11 tons. Based upon that, it would exert a pressure of around 20 times normal atmospheric pressure. That would squash the human body. That's the kind of pressure that would be on him. Well, if we t assume the roller started at his feet, as it went up his legs, the fluid parts of his body would behave rather like a tube of toothpaste, with the 
toothpaste moving in front of the roller and uh, all his internal organs, his liver and kidneys, will probably burst open. And yet, despite enduring that incredible force, miraculously, Andrew's body began to move. After it left me, I, I immediately got up uh, to my feet and started cursing and swearing at the, the roller driver. He jumped off the back of the roller and got me down on the ground, put me in the recovery position. Andrew didn't realize it, but his lungs had been punctured. I had several broken ribs and severe bruising around my groin region and uh, looked like I had a pair of uh, black pants on. But how could Andrew possibly have survived something like this? You would think the only logical explanation would be that the ground was soft and he was simply squeezed into it as the steamroller pressed over him. No, no, it was uh, compacted hardcore. There was no giving it whatsoever. In other words, a gravel base that had just been laid for the new parking lot and would appear to have very little give. And still, he survived. After a couple of days in the hospital, Andrew was back on his own two feet and back at work. Yeah, surprised looking back at it now, but at the time it was just something. I felt like I had to fight the, uh, the roller as it was going over me. Andrew claimed he withstood the force of 8,000 pounds of construction equipment. What do you think? Is it possible? We'll tell you at the end of the show. For now, see if you can guess correctly on our second mini-myth. Mini-myth number 257. Killer on the back seat. A young woman was chased down a deserted highway by a man in a pickup truck. He kept tailgating and flashing his high beams. In terror, she pulled into a gas station and ran in. The driver of the pickup truck raced after her, grabbed her by the arm, and then turned her to look at her own car. There, climbing out of the back seat, was a man with a knife. The pickup driver had told her he spotted the would-be attacker in her back seat. Every time he tried to attack, the driver would blind him with his high beams, thereby preventing the assault from taking place. Did this tale of highway horror really happen? No. The story first appeared in 1967 and became one of the favorite scary legends of that period. There is no record of it actually happening. We have three weird tales for you on urban legends, but only one is real. Is it the suicidal soldier who tried to escape his bullying sergeant but instead nearly killed him? What about the man who was run over by a steamroller and lived? Or could it be the star of her last tale, the ski bum trapped in a snowdrift who escaped certain death? Meet ski coach Jan Bondra. He's dedicated to his job on the slopes of Poprad in Slovakia. But when the workday is done, he's ready to party. Poprad is, is a party place. So we can party for 24, 36, even like 72 hours straight. If I was not a heavy drinker, I would probably be dead now. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely, I, I owe my life to Slovakian beer. In preparation for yet another big party at their ski lodge, Jan set out on a beer run, which involved a long drive through the narrow, winding, snow-covered Slovakian roads. It was late when Jan finally arrived to pick up his order. 12 cases, nearly 300 bottles of strong beer. He loaded up the car and headed toward home. But just a few miles into the return trip, the long journey began to take its toll on a party-weary Jan. So tired. I've been working and partying for weeks now. And I think it's safer if I take five minutes, just pull car over, take a little rest, rest my eyes, like, so I do, yeah? I must have fallen asleep. Yan fell into a deep sleep, and hours instead of minutes went by. 
And unfortunately for Yan, no one had yet noticed that he, along with his cargo of beer, was missing. Because back in the village, the party was well underway. His best friend and fellow ski instructor, Ivan Brokov, explains. Because when he went, yeah, maybe 10 minutes later, somebody else came, uh, came with a beer. So it was a good night, just except Jan, Jan wasn't here, so. With his friends totally oblivious to his disappearance, Jan was alone and out cold in his car. While he was asleep, nature had cruelly crept up on him. And when I wake up, I open my eyes, everywhere now is white. I open up the window, and then I realize I'm trapped. I'm under like, like a huge mountain of snow. Yan's car had been buried in a 25-foot snowdrift by the side of the road. The weight of the snow made it impossible to climb out. And with only a limited supply of oxygen, Yan began to realize his life was in danger. I think I have to stay calm, stay relaxed. Now, this is what they teach me when I train to be a ski instructor. Trapped in his car, he decided there was only one way to face his fate. If he was going to go out this way, he was going to have a party, even if it meant drinking alone. He didn't realize it, but Yan's kidneys and bladder were about to play a role in whether he would live or die. Basically, I think if I'm going to die, at least I will die drunk. But by this time, you know, um, I'm feeling like I have to make pee. I don't really want to make mess in the car. So uh, I figured I will, I will make I'll pee out of the window. Yeah? So I, uh, <laughs> I go, I pee out of the window. Resigned to his grim fate, Yan began to relieve himself out of the window of the buried car, trying at least to stay clean and dry. As he did, however, he noticed how quickly the snow melted. I start to have an idea. I think maybe, maybe I can get out like this. And so I keep drinking, I keep drinking, until I cannot take any more, you know? Until my bladder is about to burst. And so then, I pee. And then drink more, drink more, more, more. Yan was using his own urine to melt the snow around him. But is this really possible? We asked kidney specialist, Dr. Matthew Hollins. Yes, urine is uh, produced by the kidneys, and then it's sent down to the bladder for storage. Now, when it's stored in the bladder, it's at 37 degrees centigrade, and that's a lot hotter, of course, than ice, which is at zero degrees centigrade. But there's another, even more interesting characteristic of urine. Urine contains lots of salt, and that's really rather similar to the effect of gritting a row with salt to try and reduce the temperature at which the water freezes. Luckily for Yan, there was plenty of beer in the car. He didn't realize how fortunate he was to have an alcoholic substance. Any other liquid may have spelled his doom. But what's interesting about an alcoholic drink is it's not just the volume that's important, because, for example, if you were having a bottle of water, you would pass uh, a bottle of urine equivalent out within a few minutes. But with alcohol, you've not only got the volume, but you've also got the alcohol itself, which acts as a diuretic and causes yet more excretion of fluid. So for every bottle you might drink, you could easily pass a bottle and a half of urine. After almost 10 hours, Jan Bondra drank his way through 24 bottles of full-strength beer. He managed to continuously relieve himself out of the car window, eventually digging his way through 25 feet of solid snow. After a little while, my hands, they like, they, they break through the surface of the snow. And I see the morning, morning sun come in through the hole. I was so relieved. Did Jan literally drink his way out of a snowdrift? Is this story true? Before you learn the truth, here's another mini-myth. Mini-myth number 999, the burnt boozer. In 1992, Margaret Holmes of Blountville, Tennessee, was arrested for the murder of her husband. His body was found in their apartment after a fire she'd set deliberately to kill him. Her husband did die inside, but Margaret wasn't jailed for murder. Medical evidence indicated that, at the time she started the fire, her husband had already died of alcohol poisoning. 
Is the story true, or are we just blowing smoke? It was totally true. It turned out the husband really had died of alcohol abuse, and Mrs. Holmes received a suspended sentence. It's time to tell the truth. We've told you three tales from the Twilight World where fact meets fiction. Which of our three death cheaters really did cheat death? And which ones are just, well, cheats? Was it tortured soul Jonathan Overton who botched his suicide bid and wrecked more than a truck in the process? The story is false. This is a classic urban legend, told with slight variations throughout the years, and always cited to a different army base. Among the list, Fort Benning, Fort Leonard Wood, Fort Jackson, Fort Knox, and Fort Gordon. But it couldn't have happened at all of them. And in fact, it didn't happen at any of them. Perhaps it was Eastern European ski coach Jan Bondra who, trapped under 25 feet of snow, relieved himself over and over on his way to freedom. Absolute nonsense. A similar story was circulated as an email joke and even reported as news in 2005, but it has never been confirmed. Urine is warm and will melt snow, maybe even enough to escape a snowdrift. But if you drank as many beers as Yan had, you'd likely pass out drunk, then die from lack of oxygen. So that leaves us with Mr. Andrew Jepson, run over by a steamroller and lived to tell the tale. Could this really be true? Could the very machine designed to flatten everything in its path actually fail to flatten a man? Yes, it can. Andrew was flattened completely from head to toe and lives on. This amazing story hit British headlines in 1998 and Andrew's incredible survival astonished all. So do any side effects of this brutal encounter with the steamroller remain? I tend to feel the cold a bit more in my bones in the winter and just pain in my foot really where the roller made its first impact. I get a lot of pain in my foot. I can't explain how I managed to survive it. It's just, uh... His tale defies belief but is completely true. It actually did happen. That's all for this show. We hope you guessed right. If not, don't despair. Another chance to test your judgment is coming soon on the next episode of Urban Legends.